Good morning and welcome to worship. It's good to see each of you here today. A special word of welcome to visitors in our midst. And we're glad to have those of you who are worshiping with us online. I call attention to the announcements coming up in the life of the church. You'll notice several things under the journey ahead. This week we have two opportunities. One is the live nativity and Christmas festival. Most of that will be outdoors on the front lawn with hot cocoa and the live nativity scene. And there'll be a few activities indoors if you want to come in and participate in those um, ornament making or uh, making a warmth pack for one of our neighbors who spends a lot of time in the winter outside and so we'll be doing that together and then also this week we have the faith and grief lunch and our own joe walker will be speaking at that and so we're mindful that the holidays also bring a time of grief and sadness for many and that's a great opportunity to gather with others and then looking forward into the next year i call your attention to christian community camp i think christian community camp is one of the top three things in the life of this church. It has been life-changing in my family and in the lives of so many individuals and families in our church. If you've never been, I would encourage you to talk to Tyler or April and find out more about how to sign up for that. It's a great opportunity. And then one final note, and that is that we still need about 200 gloves. You can read about that under reminders um, to help make those warmth packs for the homeless of our city. And so if you have an opportunity to participate in that this week, we would love to get 200 more uh, sets of gloves. It's great to be together in worship on this second Sunday of Advent. It's great to see so many of you, and I would invite you to take a minute and greet one another with signs of God's grace and peace. remain standing as we sing our opening songs.
The Bible tells us that just before Jesus was born, John the Baptist was born. In today's scripture from Luke, we hear a song sung by John's father on the occasion of his birth. The song rejoices over the ways that both John and Jesus served as instruments of God's spirit. Listen for God's message to us today. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. As we light this candle of Advent, O God, we kindle it with peace, making room for the holy. Joy to the world, let earth receive her king. I'd invite the children to come forward for our children's moment. And as they do, I would remind you to please, if you haven't already, fill out the friendship register and that, pass it to those folks around you so that we will know that you were here. And that'll give you another chance to say good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to have you all with us. I need, I need two volunteers. Can I get a volunteer? Here you go. Would you hold those for me, please? A minute. Thank you. I need one more. Come with me here, right here. Okay. Come on down. As we gather around. All right. Good morning. How are you, Ruby? Would you like to find a seat? All right. So, I want you to pretend for a minute with me, if you will, that this is a really busy street. Can you pretend this is a really busy street, this aisle? If it's a really busy street, don't we need some car noises and some honking? Can you help me with that? How about some honking? It's, there you go, some vroom, vroom. Oh, that's great. That's a really busy street. I love it. Thank you. So if you're standing here with an adult, and this is a really busy street, don't stand in the street. Stand outside. <laughs> if this is a really busy street and we're going to cross the street, what does an adult normally say? Press the button, look both ways, and a lot of times, especially if we're really small, doesn't the adult say, take my hand, and I'm going to hold your hand across the, uh, across the street, okay? Why does the adult say, look both ways and, want to, and take my hand and all those things? Yes, please. Thank you. They don't want us to get run over. They want us to be safe, right? Okay, because they care about us, right? Do you know that there are a lot of people 
this winter that either they don't have a house or the house is really cold or perhaps they have to work outside in the cold all the time and they don't have gloves and they don't have things to keep them warm. And one of the things that we're doing as a church to show them that we care is that we're going, to, would you hold up those gloves for us? Is it we're collecting gloves? You heard Reverend Carla say that earlier, right? So we're collecting gloves. That's one sign. Do you think that if, it, because we can't hold their hand, but do you think that if they got a nice warm pair of gloves that they would know that we cared for them? Okay, that that would be a sign of Jesus' love? Yes, I think so too. Would you say a prayer with me and repeat after me? And would you all repeat after us too? Okay, all right, you can sit right there. You can, you can help me lead, okay? All right. Here. Here, I have it written down. You want to read with me? There you go. I'll let you read it, all right? Jesus, when they wear, they wear, the gloves we will share, let our neighbors know, how much we care. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. You all did wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Indeed, the gloves are just one symbol of all the many ways that we do try and share Jesus' love and care with all of the people in our community, those we know and, and strangers that we may never meet, but who will know God's love through our generosity in so many different ways. In appreciation for that, let the offering now be received.
You may be seated. There is a room in the church called the sacristy. The door to that room is right here behind the Christmas tree by the flag. There's a little room in there. It's probably the least attractive room in the church or close. There's stains on the carpet. It's not a very pretty room. It's a tiny little room, maybe just a few feet wide and a few feet long. And it's one of my favorite rooms in the church because every day when we who work at the church come to the church, we park over here, we have a key to that door, and we come in from the outside of the church into the sacristy. And then we come into the church to wherever we're going. And by coming into the sacristy, I remember that I'm not coming to the office or to a meeting or to work at my desk. I'm coming to do some sacred service. And what I also love about that room is that when I step in there at least once a week, I find someone like David or one of you they're preparing the communion, preparing the cups, preparing the bread, getting this table ready. The purpose of the sacristy is to prepare for this table to be served to you. And that sacristy reminds me that all of us are called to serve, whether we're in that room cutting up bread and pouring the juice, or whether we're out in the community serving in some other way on the soccer field or at the PTA or at the homeless shelter. All of us are called to serve the feast of God to the world. Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to his friends saying, take, eat, this is my body for you. And after the supper, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant of God's love it is for you and for many. Do this, remembering me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your table this morning to receive this cup and loaf and to celebrate your presence in our lives and in this world. During the season of Advent, as we move rapidly towards Christmas, may we find the time to be thankful for the many blessings in our lives. We are especially grateful for the people in this church, in this city, and across the globe that serve without fear and continue to make a difference in people's lives every day. Let us come to this table to celebrate, to be together, and to give thanks. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
come to this time to continue our prayer, we invite you to pause for a moment and remember those folks that you have promised to pray for. And I remind you that you can always call and leave prayers, both joys and concerns, on our daily prayer line. Let's pause for just a moment. Divine breath, every note in the course of life emanates from your grace and bespeaks the beauty and complexity of all of your creation, especially the heights and depths of human experience. How easily we recall the sweet cooing of a newborn, the lilt of family dinner conversations, the roar of cheering fans, the rustle of leaves underfoot, even that strange squawk of the credit card machine. Not so readily do we incline our ear to hear wailing parents at funerals. Your breath carries their heartbreak to the world. Not so readily do we acknowledge the cry of the oppressed as old as the Psalms and the Negro spirituals. It too comes borne on your breath. Not so readily do we strain to hear the wavering voice of our isolated elderly as they remember a favorite tune, but perhaps little else. Not so readily do we acknowledge the dissonance of the the mentally ill and their needs, perhaps in their last gasp. Attune our ears and our hearts to their songs, O God. And grant that your breath might fill our lungs so as to offer our full-throated response to your course of life through both unbounded praise and humble service. Now we lift all of our prayers together, praying as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We walked in silence. Three friends who had so much catching up to do, so many dreams to share, so much girlfriend talk, you might call it. We were walking the Camino in Spain for many days, this ancient Christian pilgrimage walk that millions of people over the last centuries had walked before us. And we decided that on this walk, we would begin each day with one full hour of silence, set the watch. And as we walked in silence, I would notice the wildflowers along the path. I would notice the stone walls lining the farmland. I would notice the stunning landscape. And in the silence, the three of us would begin to drift into a bit of silent prayer listening to our own lives, listening to our own hearts, listening to the presence of God alive in the world. And during this hour of silence, we would each save up topics that we would talk about for the rest of the hours of the day so that when the timer of one hour of silence was over, we would know what conversation we were about to jump into. What if you couldn't talk for nine months, nine months. Imagine where your mind would wander. Imagine the things that you would begin to notice about the world, about your own life. And imagine what one word you would speak if you couldn't speak for nine months and you were saving up that one thing to say when you could finally speak. So the Gospel of Luke tells us that there was this man named Zechariah who was doing his priestly service, his duty in the temple, when God came and spoke to him, and Zechariah was struck mute. 
An angel told him that after years and years of infertility, he and his aged wife, Elizabeth, were going to have a baby. And Zechariah was so stunned, and he questioned how this could be possible, and he was struck mute for nine months. But nine months later, the still mute Zechariah carries his newborn son, only eight days old, into the temple to bless him, to do the traditional ceremony where this newborn would receive his name and be dedicated to God. And when they ask what is the baby's name and they look at the father, the father is still mute. And so he motions for them to bring a writing tablet. And they bring him the tablet and everybody already knows he's going to write on that tablet the name of the father, Zechariah. That should be the name of the son traditionally. But the father writes on the tablet, John, because that is the name the angel told him the baby should be called. And suddenly, Zechariah finds his vocal cords again. He can speak. And what do you imagine Zechariah will say? What would be your first word after nine months of solitude and wondering and watching and pondering? Zechariah sings a song. The musical genius Stephen Sondheim died this week, and Sondheim once said that one of the first things you have to decide on with a musical is why there should be songs. He said, oh, you can put songs in any story, but are songs necessary to the story? And the Gospel of Luke tells us that something here can only be said with a song. And so Zechariah opens his mouth after nine months, and he sings. And he sings a hymn that he knows from his time in the temple about how God has been present in the world, not only for this last nine months of observation, but for generations. He sings saying, God has looked favorably on us. God has redeemed us. God has raised up a Savior among us. God has spoken to us. God has sworn loyalty to us. God has saved us and redeemed us and remembered us and shown mercy upon us. And then Zechariah decides to add another verse. And he sings about what God is about to do right now. He sings about this newborn, this eight-day-old son named John, who will go before the people to prepare the way for one named Jesus. And he adds another verse singing about this Jesus who will go before the people to give light to those who sit in darkness and to show mercy to the people and to heal the people. And so Zechariah sings a song about how his son will be a servant and then get out of the way and let the other one serve. And Zechariah sings a song about this Jesus who will serve the people who are poor and oppressed and forgotten. Something has happened in the life of Zechariah. Instead of just doing his temple duty of service, which is what he was doing when he got struck mute in the first place, now Zechariah has discovered a song to sing. Something has broken loose in him. And he tells us that life is going to be different now because of all that he has noticed that God has done. He is now set free to serve, and not just to serve, but to serve without fear. What does that mean? What does it mean to serve without fear? And are we afraid of serving? Sometimes, maybe it's not so much fear, but just the problem of time, and we fear giving up too much time in order to serve. Sometimes we look at our already full agendas the, the calendar is so full, we can't imagine how we would add one more thing to the calendar, let alone one of those optional service things. A, a few weeks ago, Catherine let me know that we had this opportunity to be of service at Restart Homeless Shelter to do a game night with the families who live in the Restart Homeless Shelter. 
And, and I said, well, I would love to do that. I could bring some, some children. And, and I was signed up to go. And then the day before, we got an email from Restart saying that some things had shifted at the shelter, and they, they didn't actually need us that night. And there was a part of me that was a wee bit disappointed, and there was this other part of me that was like, phew, I had such a busy day. I was going to be rushing to get there, and I really didn't have time. Sometimes we, we fear to serve because even though we think we should, it, it can feel like drudgery. For instance, you might be in a small group and the small group signs up to make taco salad for the Crosslines ministry that we serve and, and you think, well, I'd like to do that, but you know, making taco salad for 150 people, that's a lot of hauling of groceries and cooking of meat and it takes a great deal of energy, and sometimes you do it and you're so tired afterwards that you have to drive through Taco Bell on the way home to feed yourself. Or maybe you're in a small group that has signed up to rake leaves for the elderly folks, and you think, you know, I'm actually not that good at raking leaves, and my back kind of hurts, and my leaves at my house haven't been raked. Or someone invites you to go on that mission trip that Tyler's leading to Ecuador, and you think, well, sounds really cool to go to Ecuador, but... What if they don't have clean running water in the hotel? Or, or what if the hotel beds are just cots? And what if the food is inedible? You know, serving, sometimes it just isn't all that glamorous. But perhaps the biggest reason we fear to serve is that we are afraid we might lose something of ourselves in the process. If I go down to the homeless shelter, I might get too overly involved and end up giving away too much of myself. Or if I decide to give away a certain amount of pro bono work in my accounting practice or my law firm or my medical practice, maybe that will make my paycheck look a little anemic. Or if I begin tutoring at-risk youth, it might tug at my heartstrings and make me uncomfortable. Sometimes serving seems like a duty, but not a joy. We are taught by our culture over and over and over again that we're to be leaders, to seek power, to accomplish great things. But theologian Miroslav Volf reminds us that the definition of power that is revealed by the man named Jesus is far different from the world's definition of power. Jesus reveals power that looks like service. Especially during December, there is more to do. There is too much to do. There is the cookies to bake and the presents to buy and wrap and the musical events we want to attend and the parties that we've been invited to after a year of no parties. And how in the midst of all the stuff do you and I make room for the holy? We know that service is a part of that mix, that service is what Jesus came for, that Jesus said something about finding our lives by losing them. But a part of us still fears to give ourselves away in love. Last summer, I attended a funeral in this room for a man named Jim. Jim wasn't a member of our church, but the funeral was held here. And during the funeral, a man about my age got up to speak. He recalled that when he was a teenager and he didn't have much money, he really wanted to learn to play the piano. And his church had a fundraiser auction and someone donated a piano to that auction and he was determined he would win that piano in the auction. And so after bidding and bidding and bidding, he was finally outbid. But when the auction was over, this man named Jim, the one whose funeral we were seated at, approached him. Do you play the piano? No, but I want to, and I've been saving up. And so Jim took him, and he led him down the hall of the church, and they went into a classroom where there was another piano. And Jim said, how much did you bid? And he kind of was embarrassed to say, well, I bid $80. But Jim didn't laugh. Jim put his hand on that other piano and he said, would you give 80 for this piano? 
And the man speaking at the funeral said, I have had that piano in every home I have ever lived in. And just the other day, I was coming in the door and I heard my daughter and she was playing that piano. And I thought about Jim and about all the ways that Jim served, not only me, but others. And it was like ripples of water spreading out through our lives and through our world. That one simple act of kind service. Now, maybe that's not what you think of when you think of service. Maybe when you hear the word service, you think, ah, we have to rush off to Africa and be a missionary there. That's what service is, serving the poorest of the poor. But what struck me about the story that day at the funeral was that here was a story of service that was rooted in Jim's deep joy in being able to serve a teenage boy with only 80 bucks really wanting to play the piano. And 40 years later, he could stand there and remember how Jim delighted in serving and enabling him to learn to make a song. What would enable you and me to serve? Oh, oh I know, we all serve, you serve. I know, but what would enable us to serve without fear? to discover the freedom and the delight and the joy that comes when we serve. What would enable us to serve not with drudgery, not with obligation, but service that comes from that deep place of freedom and liberation and uninhibited joy? Sometimes we have to stop and be silent and remember first what God has done how God has been present among us in our lives and in our world. My friend Kathy Nichols remembers the Christmas of 1993. She remembers it so vividly. Kathy was home from college for winter break when the telephone rang and her mom answered and her mom was talking to this lady from this other church, not their church, but another church who was saying that they had recently as a church decided to help this family, a family of five kids between the ages of seven and 12 and their dad. And, and they, they needed some help from another church. They were gonna take this family out for Christmas dinner and they wondered if Kathy and her family would go in on it. And, and they realized they, they could do that. And so Kathy remembers the night that they took out the dad and the five kids to dinner and they paid for half the meal and they learned that this dad had recently come with the five kids from Honduras. They were seeking political asylum. They were here legally, and they really had nothing. They paid for half the dinner, and on the way home, Kathy and her two younger brothers and her parents talked about how lucky they were that they had a place to live, that they were not seeking political asylum, that they were not refugees. And then just a couple of days after Christmas, that, that same lady called again, and she said, we have a problem. She said, those five kids, we've just discovered they're living in a car, and their dad is in prison. They, they actually called the cops on their dad who was participating in domestic violence. Could, could you help us with the kids? Could you take just two of the kids just for a while? Well, it's Christmas break. They said, we could, we could probably do that. Kathy's mom was a university professor, her dad was a physician and a state legislator, and, and they were a busy family, but they said, well, we could do it for a short time, just two of the kids, and so they did. Well, you don't have time for the whole story, but I'll tell you what happened. They adopted all five of those kids, Kathy and her two brothers and her parents, already a family of five, they adopted five kids. Can you imagine? Eventually, all five of those kids grew up. They got married. They have their own families. And I said to Kathy, did you ever regret it? Did you ever think, my parents, like, why did they do this? And Kathy just interrupted me, and she said, I love my siblings. I love all of them. She said, we had 30 people at Thanksgiving. And I said, I know, but Kathy, that's such a huge act of service. I mean... You, you remember you had to drop out of college for two years or you chose to to help raise those kids 
How is it that your family did some kind of service that was that bold, that was that big? And she said there were three reasons, three things. One is, she said, my parents had a deep faith. They always believed that God was walking alongside of them. And second, she said, it was our church. They all stepped in to help. She said there was this one couple, and they came over every Monday night just to play games with the kids. We never asked them to. They just did it, and they accepted those kids like they were part of the church family, like part of our family. And finally, she said it wasn't all roses. There were big problems along the way, and it did not come without cost. And so... I said to her, Kathy, you know, everybody can't serve in that kind of radical way. And she agreed. But then she said to me, Carla, everybody can do something. Kathy's story reminds me that service is not what we wake up setting out to do, but rather like in her family, it just came upon them. And when it did, they found the They couldn't help themselves. They absolutely had to sing. And this Advent, we have the chance to sing or to remain mute. During this season of Advent, we go forth to make room for the holy, to prepare the way for the arrival of the Christ. We go forth confident that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit goes with us all now and forevermore. Amen.
felt like I was in cheese wagon with the, the best the, the best driver in the whole school district in County Metro. <laughs> well, finally <laughs> 